Um, but we're going to get there. All right. Good morning. Life Point, um, God's family. Yep. All right. We had a work day, fun day, work day yesterday. You're going to see some slides as announcements carry on. Um, it was it was a great day. Um, you know, normally we don't. I would say brag on people too much, but there was a handful of people here helping and it was just a great day. Um, I would like to um, honor the Johnson family. Um, um, it's just, it's cool when you can see people that want to be in the shadows serving and act like nobody sees them or, or it does it for a reward. But um, we just want to honor you guys openly and just let you know, thank you for washing the sidewalks and doing the, the, the soft wash on the buildings and any area that needed it. And for you, Brittany, just kind of hustling around, hanging out with the crew, um, and being with the babies, and just being the mom that you are. Um, I watched you drive the tractor, and I'm uh, the, the mower, and I'm just glad you didn't crash into a tree. <laughs> All right. We love you. Thank you, guys. And everybody else that was here serving, um, nothing goes unnoticed. Every handful of pine straw, every weed pulled, every drop of sweat. God collects those things and writes them in our book. Listen to this. Everything. Everything. May we be a little more thoughtful and careful about what we say and what we do. Um, because the fear of the Lord is a real thing. And it has not just returned to the church. It is returning to the church in a very real way. Because as, as it says in Peter, um, judgment first begins at the house of God. But judgment isn't always a bad thing. It is just so we know what we're doing is right or what we're doing is wrong and whether or not God is pleased or whether he is not pleased. And it has nothing to do with whether or not he loves us deeply or not. It's because he loves us that he judges us and helps us with our, our ways and helps us to know which ways are his and which ways are ours. Because, as it says in Isaiah, his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. Whew, okay. All right. Like I said, the fire's present, and it has been one of those slow burns and kind of stirrings right now. But I know if, if you're like me, deep within you, you're having this almost like the finger of God is inside of you, stirring you preparing you for the things to come, but also just stirring you now so your worship is even more genuine than it ever has been. Because there is types of offerings and sacrifices that are rejected and not accepted. And we want to be like Abel, whose offering was in faith and the best he had. All right. Mm -hmm. So I was in the restroom washing my hands, and God spoke to me. Uh, I had something already on my heart, something prepared, and he was like, yeah, you're not going to say that. You're going to say what I want you to say. And so Luke walked up to me right before we opened service this morning and was like, man, the fire's present. It's here. And it's not that just that destructive fire. It's that purifying, stirring, exciting, life-giving fire that we're supposed to be baptized in. Amen. And I know it was a word from the Lord because I heard the Lord say, I love my people. Would you please tell them, I love them and I am a jealous God. I'm jealous for you. Everything that's getting in the way of you being intimate with me, I want to deal with. I, the Lord, am seeing and searching your hearts so that you would know what is getting in the way. Not the act, but the way. What is getting in the way of me and you? Because nothing can separate me 
from my love for you, says the Lord. There's nothing, according to Romans 8, read it, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Not our own ideas, not our own behavior, not our own this or that, but there can be something that gets in the way of us enjoying the fullness of the intimacy He wants for us. We're not separated, but we can be hindered. And the Lord says, I'm removing the hindrances if you will just let them go and acknowledge them. That is it. Because my heart for you is for you to inherit everything I have. To own it. To possess it. To be able to use it and walk in it. To know me deeply and know that I always know your heart better than you do. Lord, we love you. Jesus, our author and finisher, thank you for stirring up our faith. Thank you for challenging us and convicting us, for purifying us as your people. Thank you for renewing our mind. Thank you for your presence that you never leave us. You never forsake us. On the mountaintop or in the valley, you promise to always be with us. And you're faithful to your word, Lord, because you don't lie. We love you. Receive this offering this morning. We offer it up unhindered, untethered to the ways of the world or the cares of the world. Thank you. Thank you for just being you. We love you. It's in your name. Amen.
Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. Jesus, there's power in the name of Jesus. 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 Every knee bows to Jesus. Jesus, all, every part of me, lying at his feet. I owe it all, let every breath I take rise to bring him praise to the glory of one name. Jesus. Exalted of all 
Step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Oh, beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. 
So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. And humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake you came for. So here I am. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
Lord, we bless you, Lord, and we thank you. We worship you. You are awesome. Amen. Good morning. Great to see everybody today. Welcome to Life Point Church. Our children are in transition, heading out the door. I'm surprised they're so quiet. <laughs> We're glad everybody.
everybody's here, uh, family and visitors that are here to uh, be a part of worship today. We're glad you're here, and uh, we're looking forward to what God will do. I believe that God will speak to us through his word, and uh, that is my hope and desire, <laughs> and uh, praise God. Amen? Amen? Good to see everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming out yesterday, uh, those that prepared breakfast, because that's an important part of the day, Amen. <laughs> and all that uh, contributed helping get some work done and getting some things cleaned up and, and uh, organized and planting trees, all of it, putting down stuff in the yard, and it always looks good. Uh, we don't think about it when we come to church on Sunday. Uh, if everything looks good, you don't think about it. If everything doesn't look good, you think about it. <laughs> so we're very thankful for all of our people that contribute and uh, do that because it, it would be hard to get done otherwise. So praise God. Um, I am going to, I do want to remind everyone that last week's message was not a one-timer. I would like to encourage you to practice what we did last week. Encourage you in the sense uh, we talked about shaking things off and rising up into the place that God's called you to be, to be, to identify with what God has called you to be, not with who you think you are. <clears throat> who you think you are is probably nowhere near what God thinks of you. Who you think you are can probably get you in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and if you know what God thinks of you and rise up into that and wear what he's given you, it will actually change everything around you. Because everything, like I said before, everything changes from the inside out, not from the outside in. You'll never change your life by trying to make adjustments or willing it to happen. Uh, your life will be changed when you rely on the grace of God and from the inside, he begins working on you and changing you in your thinking and everything else that's going on in your life. So um, <clears throat> just want to encourage you. You may need to go back and listen to that. That's, that would be appropriate. I, I spoke out of Isaiah. I don't remember right now the scripture I used, I mean, the, the place in scripture, but it was about rising and, 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 and standing into who God's called you to be and shaking things off of your life. And <clears throat> a lot of times people will say, well, I thought God was supposed to shake it off. We need to come into agreement with what God is doing. Uh, I know we don't always like to hear this expression, but God's hands are tied until we agree with him. And when we come into agreement, it's not you doing the work, it's you allowing God to do in you because you're coming into, if you will, the word alignment, agreement, oneness with his purpose for your life. Uh, the greatest moment of change in my life and deliverance in my life happened when I gave up trying to make my life better to please God or please anyone else. And I said, Lord, I can't do it. And God said, now I can. And I gave him the reins. I gave him the place. So that, I believe, is the greatest way to walk into a place of freedom and change and deliverance in our life. Um, <clears throat> I want to share, uh, last week I was at a, at a men's retreat in North Carolina. And one of the things that I shared on was hope. And I want to share that. So a few guys that are here may, may hear some repeat. But I really feel that I'm supposed to share this message on hope. Uh, as living life, especially in the last several years, I think one of the greatest things that's been lost has been hope. And I believe there has been a hopelessness in many areas of life, in people's lives, in, in all kinds of things. When you, whether you talk about mental health, whether you talk about sickness, whether you talk about uh, financial conditions, whether you talk about is there anything going to change to what I'm living, what I'm doing. And I believe there's been a lot of hopelessness going on 
in people's lives all around us. And can I go ahead and just be brave and say there's probably hopelessness in the room. Otherwise, I wouldn't need to speak on this. If you were all hopeful, you wouldn't need a message on how to get hope. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I'm amazed at in the book of Corinthians chapter 13, which is the chapter that speaks about love, and Paul goes into all this elaborate explanation of what love really is and God's love and us understanding that's a tremendous uh, chapter sandwiched in between 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14, which talks about the power of God, the gifts of, of the Holy Spirit, and, and God moving and all those supernatural things taking place. And sandwiched in the middle, Paul puts this chapter on, none of this works without love. And he starts explaining love. And towards the end of chapter 13, Paul makes this statement, and you probably have all heard it, and, but this is what he says. He says, and these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And he says, but the greatest of these is love. Now, I'm, I'm going to speak on hope today, but I could easily switch over and talk about love because everything is leading us into the love of God, to know the love of God, to practice the love of God, and it's going to remain forever. We're never going to see an end to the love of God. It is eternal. Now, let me tell you something else that's eternal. Faith and hope. As I'm looking at this and, and what Paul's saying, he's saying, look, these three are going to remain. There's a lot of things going to go away. There's a lot of things going to change. But there's three things that will never leave. I don't know how you interpret that, but I interpret that as being eternal. I look at that as being something that if it's going to go on and on and on, I believe it's part of who God is. Our God is a God of faith, and our God is a God of hope, and our God is a God of love. Now, whether your theology agrees with this or not, I'm going to say it anyway, because theology doesn't always agree with God. But if faith, hope, and love are going to remain in heaven... Maybe they're part of who God is. Just maybe, as we're living life, and God's created man, he's made us in his likeness and his image, just maybe God's created us with the things that we need to live life, which is faith, which is hope, and which is love. And those three things that are going to remain is because they're part of God and he brought them into our lives as part of what God wants us to be, to have in life, and as part of what we're going to continue to have on into eternity. I know a lot of times people will have this idea, well, when we get to heaven, we won't need faith. Maybe that's the finance of heaven. Maybe that's part of the economy of heaven. Maybe that's how heaven works. We won't, we won't need hope. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure that we can live without hope. Even when we get to heaven, hope is going to be part of life, I believe. Now, call me crazy if you want. That's fine. I've been dubbed that before. But... That's what I see in the Word of God. I see these things remaining. They're going to continue on. There's something that God has put in the works that He's not going to just do away with. There are things that God is going to use for eternity. So as we, we look at the Word of God, I want us to see that there is a lot in the Word. There's a lot of encouragement about having hope and living with hope in our lives and living by faith. The just shall live by faith is repeated three times, I think, three times in the New Testament, and it's taken from an Old Testament scripture. And the one thing that I look at as I look at the Word of God and trying to understand what the Word of God is really saying to me, if it's confirmed through two or three witnesses, two or three places that I can find in the Word of God that are agreeing 100%, it's thus saith the Lord. 
And it says, the just shall live by faith. In other words, those that believe in God, those that follow the Lord, will live by faith. Hebrews uh, eleven six it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Uh, Romans, I think it's in Romans chapter 14, there's a scripture that says, whatever is not done in faith is sin. So that's kind of a powerful concept that I think we need to get. Right? I think faith is something that we need to understand, which I'm not going to speak on today, but it is one of my favorite subjects because it is throughout the Word of God. And when you see something that is throughout the Word of God, it's worthy of being preached more than one Sunday out of a year. Right? Hope is the same way. Hope is all through the Bible. I mean, you can't read the Bible without finding hope in the Bible. And at the same time, you find a lot of scripture that talks about being in despair or being discouraged. And today, many of God's people, many Christians are living in great discouragement and great despair. And I would say there's a few things I'd like to say with the Lord's help. One of them being we need to hope for what is truly of the Lord. And not hope in something that is never going to happen. You got to figure that one out. You know, sometimes, sometimes we put our hope in the wrong thing. I hope Trump wins the election. That was the past election. A lot of people put their hope in Trump. Am I speaking too harshly? I've got nothing against them. I voted for them, so there you go. <laughs> but so many times, and I saw this in our Christian United States. Well, it's not necessarily Christian anymore, but I saw this in our nation that many people prophesied, believed, hoped in him, a man, rather than in God. And their hope was dashed. I'm just telling you facts. This is not theory. These, these are facts. Because we put our trust, our hope in something that God wasn't giving us to hope for. I know that's probably as more black and white than you're used to, but that's okay. How many other things? I mean, I can give all kinds of examples. We put hope. I've got, I've got a dear friend that forever, he's, his hope was that he would be a millionaire to be able to help the kingdom of God. Well, he's never gotten there because his hope is in the wrong thing. His hope is in making money and not in God. Amen. Come on. I know it's like, Richard, you can't talk like that. We, 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 we want to believe God for this, and we want to believe God for you know, prosperity and all this stuff. I get it. But hope for what God is really telling you, not what you think he's saying. We got to get hope. First, first of all, hope becomes an anchor in our soul, right? This is in the book of Hebrews. It talks about hope becoming an anchor. It is an anchor to our soul. An anchor is something, as I've gone out a few times on a boat, uh, anchors are, you have a, a hate-love relationship with anchors. Because the love relationship, you throw them in, it keeps you there. The hate relationship, you got to pick it up. When you put an anchor down, your boat is going to stay where the anchor has you fixed. It becomes your anchor, right? It's your, it's your, it's, you're holding on to that spot. It's not going to move. The boat can move around. The wind can switch. The waves can move around. But the boat's going to be anchored to that same spot. It's not going to move. Hopefully, if you've anchored correctly. Hope is an anchor for our soul. It's something that, you, that, that, that is in your life that you put, you put your, your, your faith in, you put your life in, you hold on to that, and it's like it's immovable. It's never going to change. So when you start thinking about that kind of hope, first of all, you got to come, you got to get a hope that is a true hope. One of the true hopes that we can have in life is that one day Jesus will return for his people. 
A true hope is that eternity is real. A true hope is that God exists. A true hope is that Jesus died and rose after three days. And he is my Savior. He is my Redeemer. He is my King of Kings. Those are things you can hope in, and they become the anchor of your soul. There's a lot of things that can dash your hopes when they're not in the right thing. So I just want to establish that a little bit because we... We, we so many times, we hope for the wrong things, or we're hoping, man, I just hope this changes. I hope this, I hope this goes a different direction. It's got to go a different re- direction. I hope I get this job. We can go on and on and on, all kinds of things. Our true hope needs to be fixed on something that becomes an anchor to our soul that's immovable, unchangeable. It's never, gonna, it's never going away. Where is your hope today? If your hope is fixed on something temporal, that temporal thing will be removed. If your hope is fixed on a retirement account, your hope can be destroyed. I hope it isn't. But we live in a world that there's no certainties in a lot of that stuff. I don't know, some of you have lived long enough to see that the financial markets can one day go from yay to jumping out of buildings. Hope was gone because their hope was fixed in something that wasn't real and it was temporal. I'm not praying for any of that. I'm just giving you examples to say we need to fix our hope in what is eternal, not in what is temporal. Where is your treasure? Where is your true treasure going to be? So let me go through some scriptures and uh, and just read to you uh, a lot of psalms, a lot of the psalms speak of hope. And let me just go through and read some of these scriptures. And I think uh, as I read them, it gives me hope. So let me read them. Psalm 31, 24. Be strong and take heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Psalm 33, 18. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. Psalm 33, 20. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. You kind of get a theme here? The hope is in God. Psalm 37, 34, hope in the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are destroyed, you will see it. Hope in the Lord and keep his way. Psalm 42, 9, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed? I think I missed on that verse. <clears throat> let's, let's, I think I missed putting, I put the wrong verse in, I think. <clears throat> Psalm 42, 11, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Uh, let, let me say something to you that I think is important for us to realize, that the more you navel gaze, the less hope you'll have. Does that, everybody get that phrase? The more you look inward... The more you just look here, the more your focus is down here, the more your focus is on what's going on around you, your hope goes away. You can't keep your eyes inward. You've got to keep your eyes on the Lord. Psalm 119, verse 74. Psalm 119 is, is, is a beautiful psalm. I recommend reading it. I understand it's long. It's, it's Psalm 119. It has almost, I think, I think it's 179 verses. 
Uh, and the interesting thing about Psalm 119, Psalm 119, I found out years ago, is that it's directly in the middle of the Bible. That's kind of cool. And it almost talks about the Word of God exclusively. Like almost every verse in there mentions the Word of God, the law of God, uh, God's, God's Word, somehow. Psalm 119.74, May those who fear you rejoice when they see me, for I have put my hope in your Word. Verse 81, my soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word. <clears throat> Verse 114, you are my refuge and my shield. I have put my hope in your word. Uh, anything else is, is going to disappoint. God's word will not disappoint. <clears throat> Isaiah 49, 23 says this, kings will be your foster fathers, their queens, your nursing mothers. They will bow down before you with their faces to the ground. They will lick the dust at your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. <clears throat> Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Um, <clears throat> There's so many scriptures. Let me go through just a few more. Everybody good? You getting something or should I stop? We're good? <clears throat> okay. Romans 8, 24. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So expressing what this is saying to us is hope, you have hope and you patiently wait for hope. Faith is a now thing, hope is a future thing, right? Hope is something in the future. And, and the definition of hope, the way we're using it, is, is not the definition that we would give, I hope so. And a lot of times in life, someone says, hey, you're going to make it? I hope I can. Which generally means probably not going to make it. Is it going to rain? I hope it rains. We don't know it's going to rain, but we hope it's going to rain. We don't have certainty. The, the Bible hope is a certainty. There's a, certain, there, there's a confidence in the hope uh, that we can have in, in what God says. And, and when we start anchoring in that, there is a, a definite certainty. Faith is now the substance of things hoped for. Hebrews 11.1 1. Faith is now the substance of things hoped for. Substance is real. It's substantial. It's, you can feel it. You can touch it. Substance is something solid. Faith is now the substance of things hoped for. What we can't see by faith becomes substance in our life. It becomes a reality. Thank you. I know it's sinking. It's like... I don't know that I get this. I'm, I'm telling you, and I said this many times, you can't understand spiritual concepts with natural mind thinking. You have to understand spiritual concepts by the Spirit of God. And, and when we're talking about hope in the Bible, we're talking about something that transcends the hope that we have as humans many times. We have hope in all kinds of things that never happen. It's more of a wishful thinking. I hope FSU wins. <laughs> Touching the sacred cow. <clears throat> hope, the substance. <clears throat> Romans 15, 13, get this. May the God of hope, the God of what? Do you need more reason for me to say that hope is part of who God is? 
May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in us, his power in us, is going to fill us with hope. You have hope before you have faith because your faith attaches to hope. All right. Colossians 1.27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. The mystery is Jesus Christ as our Savior and, and all that he did. The mystery of him living in us, being one with Christ and him with us. And he says, the mystery, the glorious riches of this mystery. In other words, there's all kinds of riches in the mystery of who Jesus is in our life, right? And he says, the riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. There is a hope of glory because Christ is in you. The very fact that Jesus, as we get saved, most of us, I don't know, you may have had a different experience. When I got saved, I didn't feel anything. <clears throat> I went with my girlfriend, who is now my wife, and other people, I think a sister, a brother, and all of us, uh, we were from the street. We were... We didn't dress for church. And we went into a little Pentecostal church. And the first Sunday we got there, they had Sunday school at 9 a.m. We didn't know what Sunday school was. And all of a sudden, they're ushering us into this back room <clears throat> for this class thing. We had no idea what was going on. We're just there. Just like, I want to know what's going on. Something changed in my dad's life. Heard about this thing and want to find out what's going on. I was raised in, in a Catholic atmosphere, which means I knew absolutely nothing about God. <laughs> Zero about God. If that offends you, be offended. <clears throat> I knew absolutely nothing about God. They never told us about Jesus being the Savior as the only way to get to God. There were all kinds of ways to get to God, but it wasn't Jesus. Jesus. So I go into this place, we go in there, and a young man's teaching the class, which I found out later, they became very close friends, we're still friends with them after all these years, and we get together about once a year, at least at once every two years, and just go over life and have fun together, and they're several years older than us, but it was his first Sunday out of Bible school teaching in this church, and his expectation was that he was going to have a class with preachers' kids, ministers' children, because that was all that were in the youth group. And all of a sudden, this group of five looking like gang members come in off the street and go into his class. He told me this later. He took his notes and his lesson for the preacher's kids and threw it away. And he talked about Jesus. And I don't remember a thing that he said. The only thing I knew is when I left, I had made a choice in my heart. I want this Jesus in my life. I had no feelings. There was nothing telling me that I was saved. I, no one, I mean, it's like, okay, you're saved. What does that mean? I have no idea what just happened. I just know that I want Jesus. I just know that I want to give him my life. I, I don't understand all this. This is all just foreign to me. But something pulled on my heart, and I want to give my life to him. I didn't cry. I didn't do a sinner's prayer. I didn't go through this map of salvation. I didn't do the Roman road. I just got saved. I don't know what happened. I don't even know that I'm saved. I just know that I want Jesus. Jesus. 
So a lot of times it's not about all that emotion. I mean, some of us have had radical experiences. I know of people that, that have had more, very radical experiences where the Holy Spirit's come on them and, and done th- stuff to them, just the manifestation of God's glory in their life. That wasn't what I had. So <clears throat> I'm going into that, and now I have in me this hope of glory. I don't get it all. But I held on to this hope that this is what the Word of God says. This is what I was was looking at in the Word of God. After I did that prayer, or I didn't even do a prayer. Believe me, I did not even open my mouth and say, Jesus, would you be my Savior? I'm sorry if if I fooled you all these years. I didn't have scripture that I had to go through and get on my knees and do this a certain way. But I knew something was happening. And the first thing that came in was this hope. I don't understand it, but there's this hope. I haven't experienced it. Now, over the years, I began to experience God. As the more I went after the hope of glory in me, by faith, experience came. The practical side of actually, man, now you talk to me and you know, I'm here, I'm preaching to you. And I would rather do this than anything else because I not only have hope, I have experienced by faith a real God. My hope, I still have hope for a lot of things in the Lord that are future, but there's some things that I've hoped for in the Lord that have already taken place. Now my faith has acted on that, and I can share that with you and with others and bring them into an experience that I've had with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I can speak on something about shaking things off of your life because I've walked in it. I had hope in God and that hope became realized through real life experience. That's why I can't stand, I can't stand theoretical preaching. Maybe I shouldn't say it that way. I... I long for what's real. I don't want to hope for things that aren't going to happen. Many of you know this. I've shared this many times in my life, but I ran from God for a while because what I was hearing from the Word of God, what I was hearing from the pulpit, not that anybody was bad, it was not that anybody was wrong, But what I was hearing and what I was seeing didn't match up. And and I thought, I I can't. And so I started running from my call. I knew God had called me. I knew God wanted, wanted me to preach the gospel and whatever that meant and all of that over the years. But I started running from it because, God, I can't preach something that I only know in theory. If it's not reality, I can't preach it. That's why even today, if you ask me, when are you going to preach on the book of Revelations? When I experience it. (laughs) I have no reason really to go there. I understand it's a great book. And there's some things out of it that I do understand. And not to be facetious about it, I don't just throw it away. I read it. I read the entire Bible at least once a year is my practice to at least go through the Word of God and read it from cover to cover because I want to imbibe, I want to drink in all of the Word of God, not just the parts that I like, right? Because the Word of God is going to speak and it's going to wash me as I take it in. So I want all of the Word of God. But I have to admit, there's some things in the book of Revelation. I remember uh, people asking us years ago, we were in in Mexico in the church, and, and they were saying, why don't you ever teach on Revelation? I said, because I don't understand it. And then I understood it less than I do now. And I'm still not going to preach on it. 
So don't hold your breath. I'll preach out of it. There are portions that I understand that I get, but I don't know some of the stuff that's going on there. I have a hard time with the book of Daniel. And it's like, but it's the Bible. You got to preach it. I, I, I need to preach what I know and understand. And I don't want to just give you theory about things that aren't. Or maybe they are, but I mean, we've never experienced them. I hope I'm making sense. <clears throat> so even when I talk about hope, so many times we hope for things that are not. We need to hope for what is true. When you start hearing uh, people talk, I can share you experiences I've had. You can hope for those experiences because they're a reality. They're, they're things that come from the Lord and he wants us to have. But there's some things as I'm looking around, people have lost hope because they put hope in the wrong things and the wrong things have gone away. And that's probably a whole different subject that I won't get into today, but we, we've got to start understanding how to ask for the right things. Because we, we, we do a lot of asking for the wrong things. We've got to start learning to ask for what God is actually saying and not invent what God is saying. Come on. I know that touches. I'm not saying go to the other extreme. We still need to go after God and believe God. But I want an accurate word from the Lord. I want to know what God is saying. Let's not get so over-spiritual that nothing practical comes out of what we're believing. All right, I know I'm, I'm getting in everybody's kitchen now and I'm meddling. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 4.13, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Those who sleep in death, we know there's life after death. We know there is eternity. We know there is a heaven. First Thessalonians 5, 8, Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate. And watch this. And he says, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. What is the helmet covering? your brain, your mind, your thinking. The hope of salvation as a helmet. Our hope has got to be heaven. Jesus. The hope that is certain, the hope that will never change and it won't go away. And you can anchor your soul in that hope. He's coming again. He's taking us with him. Now here's a verse that I love. Actually, there's two. I'm going to give you two. Number one, Psalm 27, verse 13. This is probably one of my favorite verses because... I don't know about you, but not everything in life I like. There's, there's some things. See, I, I don't ride roller coasters because I like control. People that are okay with giving other people control like roller coasters. I'm not keen on them. I've done them. The last time I did it, I had many regrets afterwards <laughs> for the next six hours. I rode the Hulk in Universal Studios. I did it because Grandpa's got to be strong. I can't let my grandgirl show me up. 
And I got on that thing, and the whole time in the line, I was regretting, what am I doing in this line? But I can't back out. What would it look like for Grandpa to back out? Can't do it. Just can't do it. Darlene backed out. She left the line. She left the line. And I got on that thing, and after it was over, after screaming my lungs out, I was like, never need to do this again. The last time I give other people control, that's it, I'm done. So I like a little bit of control. I like, I like to know, you know, how things are going to go and not always turn it over to the Lord. But it's important to learn how to turn all of that over to the Lord. And in that, you know, I can look at kids. I want my kids to do what I want them to do. Not what they want to do. I want them to do what I want them to do. There is not a parent in this room that thinks like that. (laughs) Except me. I want the people at my church to act the way I want them to act. Nobody in this room believes that. I've learned to turn all of that over to God. I'm, I'm confessing and just telling you I'm human. Right? We, we all get in these situations. It's like, man, I, I don't want them to act like that. I don't want them to do this. I don't want that to happen. I don't want this to happen. I, I want my checking account to look different than it does right now. I want my boss to act a different way. I want... We have all these wants and all these things that we're looking for, and most of the time, they don't work out. People don't act according to the way I think they should act. As a matter of fact, if you put your hope, listen to me, if you put your hope in people, you will be disappointed. You will be disappointed. Now, I'm not saying that's because people are bad. I'm not saying bad or good. I'm saying you're going to be disappointed because even the best of us will disappoint you unbeknowings. So this scripture means a lot to me. And this is a scripture that I can hang. It's like an anchor. I can hang my faith on because it's my hope. And it says this in Psalm 27, 13. It says, I remain confident of this. Now, confidence goes along with hope. I remain in hope for this. I am confident. There's a confidence in hope. In the God kind of hope, there is a confidence. I remain confident of this. I will see. There's no negative there. There's no maybe there. There's no what if. That's all I will see. It's a a surety. It's a confidence. It's saying this is going to happen. There is no doubt that this will come about. This is something that I can hope for. This is something I can put my faith in. This is something that I know will take place. Not something that is a fictitious dream, pipe dream out there that maybe this will happen. I know this one thing. I know this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Not the land of the dead, but the land of the living. I have great confidence in God's word and what that says. And I have stood by that scripture and believed it for as long as I can remember. Regardless of what else is going on around, regardless of the decisions, what anybody else makes, I remain confident of one thing that I will see. Let's get personal. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It's going to be before I die. It's not going to be me dying and being up there and looking down and saying, now it happens. God, I mean, really? Like, before I die? 
That's what this is saying. While I'm still in the land of the living. And I could show you other scriptures that there is a confidence, there is a hope that we can put in God that things are going to take place while we're still alive. Not after we die. None of this Christianese to where, well, listen, don't worry about it. When you pass over, everything will change and everything you long for now, you'll get when you get there. No, I want it now. I know some of you are looking at me like, that sounds kind of selfish. I didn't make it up. God did. And I'm, I'm not going after things that are unreal. I'm going after things that God says I can have. I'm going after things that I can believe God for and say, this, this is what you want me to see. I'm going to see your goodness. I'm going to see you overtaking my life with goodness. I'm going to see the goodness of God in your peace. I'm going to see the goodness of God in joy. I'm going to see the goodness of God in moving in righteousness. I'm going to see the goodness of God in experiencing the presence of a holy God in my life now. I'm going to see the goodness of God that even in the midst of evil, God is with me. I'm going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And then he exhorts us, and he says in verse 14, Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. So I'm encouraging you this morning to not give up. I'm encouraging you to not let discouragement, despair be the last thing that you think about. I'm encouraging you to get your anchor set in the hope that God has given us. In the land of the living, we will see His goodness. I encourage you to wait in Him. Waiting is not idleness. Waiting is not sitting back doing nothing. Waiting is pressing into Him. Waiting is doing spiritual exercises that so many times we think have absolutely no value and they are of great value in our lives. There's one scripture that says, first the natural, then the spiritual. You've heard that verse? First the natural, then the spiritual. God shows us things, law, spiritual laws in natural laws. So first the natural uh, you exercise. Anybody exercise? Don't raise your hand. Just be thinking. If you exercise, you have a goal to the exercise. Now, day one, you hate everything. <laughs> right? It's like, this, I can't do this. this. I'm done. After a week, when you press in, you keep doing it, all of a sudden, you get some results. After a month, you get more results. After three months, you get more results. We do not see the results on day one of what we're going to see three months down the road until we wait for it. We press in. We continue to do what we're supposed to do. Can I tell you that prayer is the same? You can start praying and see nothing, feel nothing. If you keep going and keep going and keep going, you will see the results of prayer. It's a natural law into a spiritual law. And so many times we think, well, I'm, I, we're not about works. It's not about works. It's not about your works. It's, it's, it's about agreeing with what God wants to do and saying, I'm giving my life over to you. I'm doing this, Lord, for you. I'm giving you myself. And as you do that, the grace of God begins working in your life because you're giving it place. Good? Give you one, give you one more. Psalm, not Psalm, Isaiah 40, verse 31. I think this is even a song, but I'm going to read it. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. That is a promise. Those who hope in the Lord. 
I'm encouraging you today to put your hope in what God wants you to hope for. Put your hope in Him. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not negating that God's going to do a lot of other things all around us. I'm not saying just be so spiritual. The only thing you have hope in is that eternity is going to come one day. That's not what I'm saying. We can hope in a lot more than that in the Lord than just that. I have hope for the salvation of my family. Because I believe the word of God says I can have hope in that. And so I hope in the Lord. And I wait in the Lord. I pray for them. I cover them. I call the things that are not as though they were constantly calling the things that I can't see with my natural eyes, but I can see with my spiritual eyes. I begin calling on those things and I begin speaking those things because I have a hope of what God will do. And my hope is acting out by faith in calling things that aren't in existence right now as though they were. Not as though they will be, as though they were. And I'm not even going to go down that road right now, but so many times we miss something, a truth in the Word of God. We miss it big time. Faith becomes something inside of us that's real, and you actually see it before you actually see it. Faith brings things into a reality in you that will become a reality in the physical world. I know people think, you're just talking crazy stuff now. You're talking New Age junk. No, I'm talking Bible. I'm talking Word of God. New Age stole it from God. I mean, all these other things, they've stolen God's principles. A lot, a lot of people that, that, that are even billionaires have operated on Bible principles that have worked in spite of themselves and their faith in God. There's businessmen that have learned how to give and give like most of their income away and can't give the money away fast enough because it comes back multiplied because they had faith in something they believe worked. Not in God, in a universal principle. And Christians, we have a hard time with all of that because we want, God, I want to see it before I believe it. You need to believe it before you see it. You need to learn how to see with your spirit versus seeing with your eyes. And again, I don't want, I don't want to go down that road right now because it's a whole different talk, but <clears throat> those who hope in the Lord Put your hope in Him. You're going to renew your strength. You're going to soar like wings, like eagles. If you're soaring like an eagle, it means you're looking from above, not below. <clears throat> if you're going to run and not grow weary, it means you, can just, you just keep going. You've got traction. You've got, you're going the distance, right? They can walk and not be faint. Your energy comes from him put your hope in the lord amen? amen father in jesus name i bless your people i thank you lord that as we've listened to your word lord we ask you to quicken us with your word let us know what you're saying for us even now as we put our hope in things eternal we trust you we love you we give you our hearts in the name of jesus if I could have the prayer team come up, please. As we close out, as usual, I want to give opportunity. If you need prayer for anything physical, spiritual in your life, they're here to meet with you, pray with you for a moment, and uh, bless you. And the rest of us, we're going to be dismissed. God bless you. Greet somebody before you get away. And uh, remember Wednesday, I believe Wednesday is our men's and women's gathering. Um, <clears throat> and next weekend... Uh, is a men's retreat, a Trace Diaz men's retreat that I will actually be participating in and several of the men here will be participating in. Pray for us as we're going through that and you're going to have a great speaker here in house. Uh, I'm not going to tell you who, I'm just going to let it be a surprise. But you're going to have a great speaker in house. It'll be a great time. Uh, 
just be here to support that and uh, bless us, pray for us as we're ministering to a bunch of men off on a weekend. Uh, it'll be a great time. Amen? God bless you. We're dismissed. Come up for prayer if you'd like prayer.